And on social media, your name comes up. So basically, I started acting. I was in elementary school, 12 years old. I was grateful every day that I was on set. Every day on set is a good day, man. <laughs> there is a certain energy that you kind of just want to be around them. Well, we can talk about that in a second. It's closed. Um, I'm not a sports guy. I don't even know how football is played. Despite the fact that I left the show for my own reasons, and we can talk about that if you'd like. So tell me, what's next for you? like myself now i recommend paul that you pin me because what i'm going to do is i'm going to have it like this but when you if you you know if you go on one of your like long-winded kind of diatribes yeah frequent I, i'm going to remove myself so it's just you but then if you don't pin yourself you're going to be speaking to yourself and it's awkward how do i pin um, myself so you just clap twice seriously Am I, am I, am I, is this a joke? No, no, it'll work. It's a new setting. No, I'm not doing that. Do I, I mean, it works for me. I, everybody's laughing already. I can see it. What? No. I, I, you think I'm a fool, Paul. I no. mean, I am, but there's got to be another way. Uh, so in the top right-hand corner where there's three dots next to where it yeah. says mute, yeah. click that and then hit pin. Mine doesn't say pin. Just try clapping. Oh, it didn't work. That's so crazy. <laughs> what the heck? I walked right into that trap beforehand. Oh, no, this is, I'm including all this. There's, there's, oh, there's, oh good. Oh, good, yeah. good, 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 good. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to start this, Paul, with reading your bio, which I, you had to have written because I freaking love it. I was just reading it on, uh, on, uh, on IMDb, and I don't know when you've updated it, but I'm going to start here because this makes Been a me... minute. <laughs> You're what? Uh, I haven't updated it. I wrote that when I was 24 and I have never updated it. Well, I'm going to read it because I enjoy it. Paul Campbell was born in the late seventies to Karen and Bruce Cam Campbell. Funny that how that works, who gave him his name along with a few other things like shelter and hope as a child, he showed plenty of promise period <laughs> of the punctuation. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a rash that would haunt him well into his teens. At age 18, Paul struck up a deal with the devil and traded his soul for a 20-ounce framing hammer and a rusted-out Honda. For nearly four years, he worked himself to the bone, padding his pocketbook and essentially mastering carpentry. Naturally, the next logical step was to go to theater school. Two years and 1,479 coffees later, he was certified or certifiable. But that's just nitpicking, really. Since, since then, Paul has been an active part of the North American acting community, North American acting community, spreading, <laughs> spreading joy and happiness everywhere he goes. He is currently available for, <laughs> for employment. <laughs> I have got to. Will you write my bio, please? Like, yeah, I will. Yeah, I, I can do that. Oh that's a God. good idea. I should go into bio writing, actually. Dude. I just watched a movie last night and you, the writing in it, it's easily one of my favorite Hallmark movies. I'm not just saying this because you're here. Oh, thank but, you. But it was the, also your, the, the way the cast obviously delivered your voice almost like how you would, which is fast and witty and like really clippy. Is and this think, unexpected Christmas you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That I loved it. I thought it was great. I'm just going to quickly you. rack through your, through your, your credits really quick just for some people who may not know you just to give some credibility so who that may not know me who are well, we talking to here okay, okay well these these folks know you but but you know some of the newer folks that find my podcast this is called the grass is greener and i want to go back to thanking you for the idea of actually starting a podcast but first let, uh, let me take a selfie i mean let me read your bio uh not your bio, but your credits. Just I'll do some really fast. And then we might have to stop on a couple because I'm curious about a couple things like Turner sure. and Hooch. What is Turner and Hooch? Are you doing that? Did you already shoot that? That was for Disney Plus. That was last year. Has it aired already? Yeah, it aired and it's been canceled. It's uh, oh, we did okay. one season. Good. I'm glad we started there. Yeah, great. So just uh, keep, okay. keep in the wound. Go ahead. Okay. Love Classified. Now, uh, what is that a, a TV? Is that uh, What's that? You just did it? Boy, 
I did a cameo in that. That was a Hallmark movie that aired earlier this year with Melora Hardin. And uh, I did a cameo. I went in and did a day as the, uh, bartender. the bartender, the snarky bartender. I like it. Now, was the let me ask you this. Was Andrew Walker's cameo in uh, An Unexpected Christmas? I know they're cousins, but was that whose idea was that? Andrew was in town filming his Christmas movie and he and Tyler just thought it would be funny. Yeah, he so even, he used, he even used his name, right? He's like, uh, two for Walker. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it. That Nine Kittens of Christmas, uh, The Santa Stakeout. Then we go down to Christmas. Man, there's a lot of Christmas movies in here. Christmas by Starlight. I know. Uh, Wedding Every Weekend, Holiday Hearts. I think our IMDb's are very similar, bro. Like when you look at who's producing our last decade, <laughs> it's like Hallmark. They are. Yeah. Hallmark, Hallmark. Hallmark. Who feeds uh, us? So and then, but then we arrive right after God went Christmas is the girl in the bathtub. Say more about this. This was like a, this was like a scandalous lifetime movie that I did. Uh, funny story. They, so it was based on a true story about a young woman who got caught up in a, a love affair with this married man. And, and she had uh, substance abuse issues and, she started to get into these sort of like dream states and it was, and it ended up very tragically for her. And I played one of her coworkers that had uh, some romantic interest in her. And uh, <laughs> there was one simulated love scene that was like, uh, that was in it. She was having a dream, but it was like myself. And then it was another coworker. And we got in there to shoot the, the love scene. And the director was like, okay, Paul, here's what we're thinking. Um, so we think, you know, you're going to like, pull off your shirt. And I was like, Nope, I'm going to stop you right there. Uh, I'm not going to have my shirt off. She's like, but it's a love scene. And I was like, I realize that, but you're going to have to do it with my shirt on. I work for the Hallmark channel and I'm not doing like, and she's like, okay, then we'll do it with the shirt on. So you see, I'm like the only one with a, with a shirt on in the, uh, in the movie. I was protecting my, uh, my innocence there. I was protecting my innocent image. Missed opportunity. Missed uh, opportunity. Yeah. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Perhaps. Uh -huh. Maybe I'm saving it up for a Christmas for a Christmas movie. You know, for I'm a big actually, movie. I'm sad about that. Uh, let, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Thanks. The girl in the bathtub is perfect lifetime movie name. I think my, mine was like "Do No Harm" or something. You know, uh, they're all they're all. But a girl in the bathtub wins. That's terrific. Uh, did they like look? Did they look at the script and was like, "There is a girl in the bathtub. Let's call." Them. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, hmm, we're out of names. We're out of names. Well, she is in a bathtub at one point. So that's kind of how it works, I think. I like that. Uh, okay, then we got Take Two, Sun, Sand, and Romance. Uh, so you, you, you've danced between Lifetime and Hallmark a few times, huh? Um, well, sun, no, Lifetime, Sun, Sand, and Romance. Take Two was for, uh, I want to say, the CW. That was that. Right. Um, and then Sun, Sand, and Romance was with Trish Helfer. That was uh, how I ended up. Working with Trish Helfer. No. That was the first movie I ever sold. That was that was mine. That's yours. Yeah, I produced that one. Yeah. And wasn't that one of their first like location movies too in a while or something? It was. It was the first year that they started doing real seasonal. It was the first year they started doing summer movies. And where did you shoot? Mexico? Mexico. The Trisha Helfer chapter is really something we that I, I hope we can get back to because Paul... Uh, uh, Paul and I did a really cool interview, um, which I have to find and repurpose for this, but, uh, and cause you did Battlestar Galactica with Trisha, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then her and I played volleyball against each other when we were in high school and the same Kelly Streit from, from, uh, Alberta found her for, and she won supermodel of the world in 1992. Of course. And, uh, and I got runner up for supermodel of Canada yeah which was which was quite deflating still um, no nothing to nothing to balk at that's that's i didn't get i didn't even make i didn't get the participation ribbon you know you got runner up and i didn't even uh, get invited to the show so listen well, it was a it was a so the best of times and the most confusing of times that was night the early 90s you know i was like yep incredible leaving one life and and diving into another one like a leaving a very promiscuous life and diving into like my decade of Jesus. It was like the wildest. We've talked a little bit about this, but it's like, yeah, it was, a, it was a wild time. Transformational. Yeah. 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 
and, and, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and, and yeah, confusing yeah. when I look back at it, like in some ways, I'm like, man, here I was like in Milan and Paris and with backstage with naked models and had my Bible and my guitar. Like it was a really interesting time. Yeah. I can only imagine. Certainly the only one. Certainly <laughs> original. All right. Then we the dance down into spun out. Now, is that the Will Sasso, uh, is that the thing you did in Canada? Like, Will, is that the sitcom that was a Canadian sitcom? Yeah. Will Sasso just came and did an episode. It was Dave oh. Foley. Dave Foley uh, was the lead. And then me and uh, it was like, there was like five, six main cast members, but it was a live action. It was like a multi-cam, a four camera sitcom in Toronto. We did two seasons of that. Did you like, did you like it? It was the best, the, the, the four camera live audience performances is the most fun you'll ever have in your career. Um, if you like comedy and if you like improv and if you like that spontaneity and uh, it's, there's nothing like it because it's like theater. It's the energy of theater with the ability to break the fourth wall constantly and to engage with the audience and to intentionally, what you're doing is you're trying to make the audience laugh. And then once they've laughed once, you can tweak a joke and do it again. And it's, there's something really, it's like stand up comedy and theater and improv all mixed into one. It's extraordinary. Terrifying, wow. but wow. so terrifying. Fun. I bet. Now, did you ever do yeah. stand up? Um, just side. I did it once. Yeah, I did one five minute set <clears throat> just to prove that I could do it. And it's terrifying, but I did yeah. it. Yeah. And is that something like, cause you're such a good writer, like, and, and you, it seems, is this something that you would do again? Or are you not in interested? I, I have a bunch of, <clears throat> pardon me. I have a bunch of stand up written. I probably have 20 or 30 minutes of stand up written down. And I come up with these bits sometimes and when I go on it, when I get a bit, I'll just write it down in the notebook, but I don't know where I would perform it. Those the standups, the, the genesis for standup, like starting out at open mics and stuff. I don't, you know, you really have to hone your craft and figure out how to tighten those jokes, make those jokes work. It's a real process. I don't think I can just get up and do 20 minutes of standup. And I don't know if I want to go to open mics and start from the, from ground zero you should do three minute tiktok videos and then the response of the sharing and the response of the comments and this that's how you'll know if a joke's funny is if you connect with them like if i was starting off as a as a stand-up i would just make a bunch of like take the joke and do it as a minute or a three minute or now tiktok's getting a little longer too and then and then you you're like if you're if nobody shares it or likes it or or comments you're like well that that was dirt it didn't might, work lower stakes too right because you're not you don't have the shame face if nobody loves you like in the room yeah that's true maybe I, i've considered it i've tried I, I have considered i don't know if tiktok is the best medium for stand-up comedy because really it's so tough to sense i mean in comments like haha funny i don't know is that a genuine laugh you know if someone if your whole audience at a stand-up club was like hey yeah 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 funny 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 you're like is, are you laughing or, you know, or like a thumbs up uh, comment on your joke? Is that, are you pitying me? Is that a pity thumb? Right, right, right. Yeah, way to go, know. buddy. But, but still, yeah. no matter what it is, it's less painful than totally bombing a live room. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Right. Yeah. Um, and you have, dude, you're, 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 you're one of the funniest guys I know. And I, and I really, really enjoy your writing, like from your bio to your, your movies to, I'm Thank sure you. your, you, your, you should write your own eulogy and just like have it in your, just make sure that somebody reads it. Oh, that's a good idea. Right. I what? should write it. That's a little, uh, it's a little dark, but yeah, I should write the eulogy. That is something I would do is go yep. just a hand out of the coffin, uh, read this. Uh, oh, thank you, sir. And uh, oh, yeah, this is funny. I love it. Well, we, you got to begin with the end in mind, and you know everyone's into stoicism these days, so you got to face death fi uh, head on and make best friends with the worst case scenario, I guess, or in some cases the best case scenario. Some people are excited to get off the planet. 
Right. Who, who raise a show of hands, uh, show of hands. Who's ready. Who's excited to leave? Let's go around the room. Uh, show of hands. Excited to get off the planet. No. Oh, oh, you are. Okay, great. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's a small crowd. It's a, you should write jokes just for that community. (laughs) Yeah, I should. (laughs) Kill it. You'd kill it. It's a small niche. The easy come, easy go community. Yeah. 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 So you, I'm just going through the supernatural rusty steel. Ooh. I did that with Johan. That was the movie I did with Johan in um, in uh, uh, that country, the Eastern. Well, I can't think of it now. Uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, you know what it was? G- Gibraltar. No, come on. Uh, where all the cheap movies are shot? Romania. Estonia. Romania. We did oh. it in Romania. Yeah. Was that with his friend Stevie, the guy who wrote it, or no? No, that was with this like Romanian mafia guy. I kid you not, mm. who went to UCLA as a 45 year old or 50 year old guy, went to UCLA creative writing, wrote a feature film during the writing program, didn't spell check it or edit it once. I kid you not. And then got money somehow and then paid us to come and make this high, high action adventure on the seas type searching for gold movie. And it was the wildest filming experience of my entire life. Uh, It was so shady and so odd, the whole thing. How was the craft services? It was a nightmare. They didn't have it. There was no craft services. (laughs) And all they fed everybody every day for lunch was meat. There was we there was no no vegetables. They would just put put meat on the grill and they'd give you a plate of meat. Was Johan still a vegetarian at that point? Oh yes, he demanded. Well, he was pescatarian, so he he uh, he demanded that they have fish for him. But there were other people on the cast and crew that were vegetarians, and uh, they were out of luck if they didn't bring their own food. Wow! Wow! Yeah, it was wild, and it was like uh, like 95, 98 degrees. Mm. And we were out on this boat on the, on the water for, I don't know, 12, 14 hours a day. It was okay. bananas. Oh, man, 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 man. It, it, that'll makes that makes me nauseous thinking about it. I don't like any amount. You probably got sea legs after a few days, but ugh, that's rough. Rust I'm pretty is- tough. So, you know, not much shakes me. Really? What, wait, yeah, what no. is it? What makes you so tough? Your, your carpet genetics, tree? just genetic <laughs> lottery. People don't know how, how amazing of a carpenter you are. I don't think like, that's another thing you could just do. Like you could do TikTok videos of you just fixing, making things look awesome. Like you're, when I, when you showed me what you were doing at your, both your places in Vancouver, I was like, I couldn't believe it. Oh, thank you. I, that is one thing that I've wanted to do is actually TikTok videos on like the most simple household fixes that people really want to be, don't think they can do, but uh, are actually really easy to do. There's so many things that are so accessible to the vast majority of people with a screwdriver and a hammer. And, uh, and I'd love to just show people like, you know, if your towel rack is coming loose and you've got a hole in your wall, it's so easy to fix that and not go, Oh, how do I, do I have to call a carpenter to fix this? I would watch that. Cause I have a toilet like holder where the one side like it's been it's got so many issues because my son I was trying to train my son and be like hey you put the towel rack in and now that one side is just like it keeps coming out so we keep making new holes and it's just I would watch that and you're funny and you know who nowadays you get enough movement on it somebody will just offer you a show and that could be really fun too I had pitched a show to Hallmark years ago when they did home and family I'd pitched a segment to come on and do like uh carpentry with paul and i think the show was just about to get canceled so mm. they didn't bite but thank you yeah I, I would love to do that it's it's such a passion of mine and so how far back does this acting thing go 2009 2008 2004 battlestar galactica is the 2004 mm-hmm. uh, that was a few seasons right i did the mini series and then i did uh two seasons yeah Day, days of our lives. There you go. Oh, you know what that was? What? So that's another, that's a really funny story. Uh, when I was, the reason that I ended up leaving Battlestar Galactica is because I booked a pilot called Nobody's Watching. And uh, for those of you who don't know what a pilot is, uh, they fly an airplane. Um, 
jokes. It's what they call the first episode of a TV series when they're making it. It's like a test. It's a test episode. So they'll make a test episode and see how the audience responds. And then if the audience overwhelmingly gives it a thumbs up, then they'll turn it into a series. And this was a pilot that I did for a guy named Bill Lawrence uh, for Warner Brothers at the time before Warner Brothers became the CW. It was a multicam in front of a live audience uh, pilot. And my co-star uh, and, and one of my very closest friends to this day it was Taryn Killam, who ended up going on to Saturday Night Live and a bunch of other things. We were these, I was 24, he was 22. And we were these like two kids that had never, never done anything like this. And we did this pilot. It turned out really, really well. And the, the idea was it was these two guys from Ohio who are sick and tired of all the nonsense they're seeing on TV. So they got, so they get hired by Warner brothers to make their own show and live on a soundstage while they make their own show. That was the conceit. And the, the pilot didn't get picked up, but the Bill Lawrence, who was the showrunner on the pilot, the creator, he was like, I don't think we're done with this yet. And this was just at the time that YouTube had started. This was right around the beginning of YouTube. And he said, we made an agreement with NBC he said, if we can build these guys a following online as these two guys from Ohio, not as actors, but like create these sort of fake uh, IDs for these guys and build a following online, can we come back and make the show? We'll bring an entire audience with us. And so it was Bill Lawrence's goal to get Taryn Killam and Paul Campbell on every sing as much TV as much TV exposure without anyone knowing that we were actors as possible. So one of the things was we appeared as extras in days of our lives. And there's an episode, we had an agreement with the director. There's an episode where we're pretending to be waiters and we're heavily featured as like these two guys who are having an argument as waiters in the background behind the scene, the real serious scene that's going on. And you can see the camera kind of cutting to us. And we look directly in the camera at times uh, another thing we did was we went to the Emmys. This was the best thing we did. Bill Lawrence uh, had been nominated for Scrubs and had two seats real close up to the front of the Emmys. So he dressed us as valets. We got us into the red carpet. We got into every interview behind Steve Carell. We got on camera, peering over Steve Carell's shoulder, waving into the camera. You see us in all the interviews. And then we're sitting in the Emmys amidst a sea of black tuxedos in our red valet outfits. And uh, this guy, John Kassar, wins the Emmy for Best Director for 24. And as he stands up, we're standing right behind him. And we stand up clapping these two valets. And it's on the live broadcast of the Emmys. You can find it somewhere online. So we did 10 of those things where we were just all over TV and then the show never ended up getting picked up, but we had a year of just dumb stuff like that. It was really fun. That sounds amazing. So the, the creator of that, did he create Scrubs or? Yeah, he was the creator of Spin City and Scrubs and then Cougar Town. And wow. now um, uh, what's the one with Sudeikis that he's the coach? Barry? No, oh. no, no. Oh, you're kidding me. Uh, yeah, it's Bill Lawrence. Yeah, that was his. Yeah, the, the uh, mustache. Yeah, a coat. What? Uh, I know. I'm, I, I I'm love my brain it. Is I've seen it so today. many times. It'll be in the chat here really quick. Uh, so now, is that why you didn't sign the extra time and contract for Battlestar because of this thing? Kind of. Do we get time for another quick story? Yeah, of course, man. <laughs> Uh, so that pilot, I had booked that pilot after we did the mini series of Battlestar Galactica. And then when the producers of Battlestar Galactica found out that I was going down to LA to do a pilot, which would have potentially taken me out of contention to be in season one of Battlestar, they said, what are you doing? How, what are you, how come, how come you're not, you know, sticking around? And I said, you don't have me on a contract. They didn't have any of their actors below like number seven of cast they had 13 cast members but they only had seven on contracts and i said i'm not on a contract and this is a huge opportunity and they said okay the show the pilot didn't get picked up i did season one of battlestar and then i had another opportunity to do a pilot for uh the show psych it turned into the show psych on oh, USA yeah. Network. maggie lawson maggie lawson and uh, james roday it was a huge it was a huge pilot 
And so we were between, we were just about to start season two of Battlestar. And I got this call, do you want to come down and test for this pilot? And when you're testing, that means you're one of three choices for that role. And so I went down and I met the producers and uh, they had seen nobody's watching the other pilot. They said, we love you for this. So I went in to do the test and the offices of USA and, um, and Sci-Fi Network share a floor at 100 Universal City Plaza in at the studios at NBC, NBC Universal. So I walked in to go to the, the big audition for Psych and somebody from next door at Sci-Fi said, is that Paul Campbell? What are you doing? Battlestar Galactica, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm actually walking next door to audition for this other show. And they went, well, that's interesting. So I did my audition and I had about an hour break before I did the final, final big audition for all of the producers and all of the network. And I got a call from Ron Moore, who was the creator of Battlestar. And he said, hey, I heard you're over at NBC in Los Angeles right now. What are you doing there? He said, well, I'm testing for this show. And he said, we have season two of Battlestar about to start. I said, well, I'm not on a contract. And he goes, okay, I'm going to offer you a full contract for four years. I'll offer it to you right now over the phone for your contract at a really dumb amount of money, uh, about four times as much as I was being paid. Um, and he said, but I need you to commit to this. Otherwise we're going to have to kill you. And I said, I'm about to walk into the biggest audition of my life to be a star in that show. I got to say no, Ron. So I hung up the phone. I walk into the audition. There's only three guys, myself, James Roday, and one other guy. And as I'm walking into the audition, which was a tiny boardroom with about 25 of the most powerful people at NBC in the boardroom. Uh, and as I'm walking in, the casting director whispers in my ear, it's your job to lose, which meant I was the first choice. And all I had to do was not screw it up. And it was my job. And it just got in my head. I just like, it paralyzed me. And I went into the room and I blew the audition so hard. I just, I couldn't get words out. I blew it. And I walked out and I had just, I had just turned down a lot of money and I just lost this job. And, uh, and then I did end up going back to Battlestar and episode three of season two, one of the actors came into the trailer and she goes, Oh, it looks like you died today in this episode. They had written in, you know, my character takes a bullet. And I was like, well, that's too bad. And then by the time we got to shooting that scene, that line had been removed. They took out that I die and they let me live for about 10 more episodes. And then they killed me. They killed you. They killed me. He was true to his word. And then I didn't work for 18 months after that. What, how did you get through it? Did you, did you, I mean, just, just back up a second. Those yeah. moments, those moments when you're standing in front of a boardroom of executives and you have this little piece of paper in your hand that is sort of your friend, but also your enemy, because you're like, I should be off book by now. Right. Like all that stuff. But you're like, I, did you have your paper with you or no? Not for that one. Okay. I wish I did because I forgot all the words. And I have my mind is like a steel trap when it comes to, to uh, I, I just I don't ever forget dialogue. I just it just got it's yours to lose. Just got in there and just shook me. I don't know. It was uh, I get it. No, no, no. I get it. We're, yeah. we're very delicate uh, people, us actors. And those moments of there, there are the pressure. There's a lot of pressure in those moments. Now, now, what did you learn from that like experience? And obviously 18 months after to not work is like a, a serious, what did you learn from all that? You know, I don't regret my decision at all. I, I swung for the fences. I did what I thought was best in the moment. And in this business, as you well know, you have to, right? You have to just go with your gut so frequently. So often you reach a crossroads. It's like, well, you've been offered two jobs. One, one is this and one is this. You got to pick one. It, it always seems like there's two, when it rains, it pours. You, you, go, you, work, you don't work for 18 months and then you have three things that happen the same week and you have to pick one and you have to sort of figure out what will be the most beneficial. Um, I don't regret the decision. Financially, it would have been great, but um, and I've faced those moments many times in my career. I think if anything, I've, um, I probably now that I'm in my forties, 
I a bird in the hand, you know, is is better than two in the bush. And I'm and I would be much more inclined to accept the sure thing and the stability. Um, but in my 20s, you know, I had no responsibilities. Uh, I just was I was just happy to be there. And, and I and I honestly never thought that it would slow down. I was on a trajectory that I thought would continue forever. Uh and that was just my inexperience in the business. And, um, but you know, I'm a little more seasoned and a little more <laughs> experienced now. I would, I would take the sure thing, even if it wasn't quite as creatively satisfying now, but that's because I have a son and, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be a responsible adult, but yeah. uh, I don't regret it at all. No, what a, what a, what a story. I'm glad you shared that. I've never done this before. I've never gone through somebody's, uh, IMDb it's such a treasure of like stories. It's so fun. So I've never, many. I'd forgotten these stories. No, well, I've never done this with an actor where I'm like, tell me about the perfect score, the guy in the truck. That sounds like a real big one. Uh, you want to know that story? That's a good there a, story. Is there a story with the guy in the truck? This is my first job ever. It's the last story I'll tell you, but it maybe is my favorite story. It's how my whole career started. Tell us. I love this. So, I was, uh, I was a carpenter for years before I went to theater school, uh, per my bio. And when I graduated from theater school, I had absolutely no idea how to start a career, how to get an agent. So I just went back to construction and I was building somebody's kitchen, uh, a friend of the family. I was working on his kitchen and I got a phone call from a friend of mine who I'd graduated with. And she said, Hey, I just ran into this guy, Eric. And he had been a year behind me in, in theater school. And this is probably five months after I'd graduated. I just got a call from Eric. Uh, or she, I just ran into Eric. I actually ran into him in the shopping mall. And she said, hey, Eric asked if I was ever in touch with you because his agent had come to the final show, the final performance. We did Cinderella, the musical, and had seen you in the final performance of theater school. And I told Eric, hey, that guy's really good. Give him, give him my phone number. And he had just either been too shy or he had forgotten and he never passed the info along. So I ran into him in the mall and he said, if Paul's still interested in acting, he should call, call my agent. And I was already completely back into carpenter land. I was like, okay, I guess I'll call this agent. So I called this guy and he said, Hey, Oh yeah, I remember you, you were in, you were in Capilano college. Uh, do you want to come in and do an audition for me? And I said, great. So he sent me the audition sides and it was for a movie called The Perfect Score and it was for the lead. And so I came in and I read the, they were actively casting for it. So I came in and I read for him and he went, oh, that was really good. I'm going to send that into casting. Uh, I'm going to take you on as a client if you'd like, but I'm also going to send that into casting for the lead in this movie. And he sent it into casting in Los Angeles and they were like, we love him but we have an offer out to this young guy, Chris Evans, who you may or may not have heard of. Uh, Chris Evans accepted the offer and they said, well, we love Paul. We'd love to give him a role in the movie here. We we've cast most of it, but there's this role of like this, there's a guy driving the truck and he comes through and like, if Paul wants to be in the movie, here's this role. So <laughs> they offered me a role in the movie uh, from my audition to get an agent. And that was it. That's how I started. It was my first job. Wow. I love that you told, I was actually going to ask you how you made the transition from, from uh, carpentry into acting. So it was a run in, in the mall between two people that I'd gone to school with. I never would, I never, if that hadn't happened, I would be building houses. And imagine like, had you sat in your car for what, 10 more seconds, five seconds, three seconds, like, or, or had you just, you know, actually brushed your teeth that morning or. No, please. Come on. That's gross. Um, but, but this is why, and I think we're similarly minded. This is why I go back and go, do I regret choosing that audition over one? No, because every single second, every single step, every look, every choice has led me exactly to where I am. So if you change mm -hmm. one thing, you, you alter the trajectory of all of it, I think. It's the, that sliding door effect or the butterfly effect. Everything is, everything is so at least for at least one way of looking at it, if you choose to look at life like this is that life's happening for you, right? It, it, it's maybe it isn't, but it's a, it's a nice perspective. You can choose that life's happening for you, not to you. Jim Carrey has a really famous speech. He's like, he's, I think he's delivering it to a college or university. And he's like, he's like, I don't know if life is happening for me. Uh, 
or to me, but I choose to believe that life is happening for me and I'm not mm. a victim, but it's just like a choice. It's a choice that all these things are actually working for your, for you in a beautiful way, rather than like, Oh, I missed that thing. And then like, it's just, it's so, it blows my mind the opportunity that there is in perspective. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting perspective. The, the Jim Carrey quote, I think we do get to choose uh, if, if we want to go deep. I think we do get to choose what this experience is. It, the, the, the looming meaning of life question really the only thing that we can really control is that, that particular piece is how, how we view life right now, the present, how we view the, the time that we have on this earth, I think is the only real, for me, that answers the question is what is the meaning and how do we go about this time that we know we have on earth? Yeah, for sure. Whoa. No, Whoa. and it's, it's, it's just wild. Like, and, you know, obviously as a father, these things like how old is Kingston now? Six. You just turned six. Wow. My son just turned seven months yesterday. Crazy. Uh, going, going through it all again. And it's such a, it's such a unique, such a unique journey. And, you know, you and I met because of Johan, but then turns out, you know, the Kingston's ma uh, was actually at my wedding, which is just like the wildest. My, my best friend, Johan says, Paul, you got to meet my friend, Paul Campbell. And uh, he's, you know, we did this. I didn't know it was Rusty Steel. It was like, we worked yeah. together. <laughs> and um, I think you guys are really going to like each other. And then, and then did I come by myself to your house or was someone with me? Do you remember? I, I believe you came by yourself. And then you showed me all your, your carpentry. And then we discovered that, that Lori, you know, Kingston's mom was actually, uh, you know, your partner at the time was at my uh, wedding 30 years, 25 years prior. And this is like, you and I are, were connected in this really interesting, interesting way. And, uh, and then, and then, you know, we, we had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time in Vancouver whenever I would come into town. But, um, but, and th then when you guys came to LA, you had this idea for two Pauls and a pot. Was that you? How did that start? You were like, let's do a podcast. This was even eight years ago or something or seven, six, six years. Yeah. Ago. Maybe six years ago. It just started out as a joke on Twitter. I was like, uh, I was joking. And I said, Oh, two, two peas in a pod uh, would be a funny name for a podcast. Two, two peas in a podcast would be a funny name for a podcast. And I was like, wait, I'm actually going to, I'm going to take that name. And then, um, and then I was like, well, it'd be funny if it was two Pauls in a podcast. Now I just need to find another Paul. And, uh, and then you were like, I'm, a, I'm another Paul. I was like, great. I think we just started a podcast. And that yeah. was it. Two and we're, we're, are, we have a, a stellar first season. We have two, a, a big two episode arc to our first season. They're good, though. They're good episodes. We have a great musical intro, uh, thanks to you. I, they were very charming. We should, uh, well, we'll add this one to our our third one, maybe, maybe what we'll do is, uh, you know, with zoom, it's so easy. If there's somebody you want to talk to, we just throw them on as a third thing here. And we just, and we just, we just intimidate them with uh, dry humor. That's a great, that's, that's how I've, that's my whole MO. It's just intimidate people with dry humor. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you working on right now? What are you doing? Like, I just wrapped a movie with Rachel Boston called dating the Delaney's. Yeah, you did. She's a new mom. She's a new mom. And you know, what's funny. So her, her little one was on set, her little potato and uh, the cutest, cutest, cutest kid you've ever seen. She's Is five right? months. She, but she named it potato. That's not. No, I named it potato. Her name is Grace, okay. but she's the stunning little child. And she was on set. And, but the funny thing is, um, we, this was the first time either of us have played parents and we were parents to uh, 14 and 16 year old kids respectively in this movie. This is like two, two families uh, coming together, two people finding love late in life after one is divorced and one is a widower. And uh, it was a vastly different way of performing for me. It was a totally different character. It was really, really interesting.
Mm. Did you get to have your witty humor or was it pretty dramatic? Oh, yes. I got to, we had free reign to improvise. And this was, they, they really said, we want to find all of the humor in this. And I just went for it. So we'll mm. see how much ends up in there. The script was really charming. Right. Um, but I went, I went next level with the Did jokes. You, who directed you? Um, Alan Harmon. I don't know if you've worked with him. He's phenomenal. Oh my gosh. His daughter, Jessica, Jessica. is directing something that I'm in the very last stages of like contract stuff with, um, which is, it's a Christmas movie. Um, Jessica, okay. I can't say too much more about it because it's like, it's not there yet, but um, she had asked me if her dad had directed me before. And I was like, no. Uh, um, and, he, and, and so how, how was that experience? He's quite the, he's a veteran, huh? He's the head of the Directors Guild of Canada. He is, he is the most veteran of veterans. And uh, I've worked with him once, once before and the, uh, on a movie with Ashley Williams. And one of the things that comes with that level of experience that's so lovely uh, is this just an incredible ease in everything that he does. Mm -hmm. So he's never ruffled. He's never rushing. He always knows exactly what he wants. And he has the confidence to let actors come in and play in the space because he knows that he'll find, you know, he's not like, well, it has to be exactly what's written because I have this shot that he just goes, yeah, just come in and play. We'll find it. We'll find the movie. He knows he'll find the movie in there. And it's, there's so much freedom to just, you know, it, not everything we try is a home run, but to be able to not feel constricted in any way uh, and to tell the story how you feel like it should be told is such a wonderful experience. If you ever get the chance to work with him, he's, mm. uh, and he's just a really, really good dude. Is he, is he, his daughter's really dry and sarcastic and is he like, I've that? never met her. I don't know. She just directed another big one for Hallmark, a tennis movie that was okay. produced by Venus Williams, I think. Oh, is that right? This movie is not for that. Hallmark, but it's, um, it's, it's something that's, that's, um, Ooh, yeah. the guy in the bathtub. It's called, <laughs> no, it's two guys in a bathtub. Oh my. Yeah. Have they not... got the other guy yet? I'm available. <laughs> that's what, that's what this uh, interview is for. They, they asked me to find the other guy and I was like, well, I know I should probably, I have a podcast. It could be a little sneaky, but I'm going to work on it. Two Paul's in a bathtub. Two Paul's in a bathtub. We could do our podcast from a bathtub. <laughs> so Guys, the ratings that... weren't great for that episode. No, no, but uh, it expanded the demographic a bit. So, um, so congratulations on 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 finishing that movie. Now, Mike, obviously, unexpected Christmas. I know it's in the past, but I just want to talk about it for a second because I just want to. I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed it, and I, and I, I've I've been forced to watch a few Hallmark movies, and I there's so many eye roll moments where you're like, oh, here's that moment, here's that. Somehow, you managed to keep my attention. In it was, I think it was part. I mean, the editor, the editing was great because because mm -hmm. the, the timing was so good. I feel like the cast was so the mom. Who's the mom of uh, like Tyler Hines's mom in that? She was awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to remember her name. She was so the cast in general. I, I'm so bad with names. Um, Don't worry the, about it. The cast in general was phenomenal. Was so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Starting right at the top, Tyler and Joy just, I mean, you know, when, when you write something, your dream is to hand it over to uh, a cast like that and go, take these words and do what I was hoping you would do with them. Do, do it and more. They, they, they brought even more to it. It was, yeah. I was so happy. I, I was so impressed and I laughed out loud just a couple, and I mostly laughed at the little like throwaway little snarky things that was, and you know, there's the timing and the and the and I thought even the the music was really good too, which is can it can be so cheesy and overwhelming sometimes the music and the music supported it really well. Uh, I also <clears throat> really liked their the, their relationship and like where where there was a lot of them together, which sometimes can be boring in in one of those movies. Like 
but the, 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 the conversation with them, the, the, the two hand, like when they were talking with each other was really interesting. And normally those scenes are just like, Oh, come on. Can we just like, you know why they're like that? Uh, mm-hmm. What I've realized they're like that because in so many of these movies, people are meeting each other for the first time. And then there's this mandate for discovery about what are your likes? What are your Christmas traditions? What, you know, and you're like, uh, it's all exposition. Yeah. When I was younger and my father and you're like it's so many, it. but when two people have a history and they know each other intimately, you don't have to discover each other. That was one of the challenges of writing. This was how do you have two people fall in love again when they already know each other and it's all new experience. And it's, it's not this like, uh, so tell me. And then you sink into those stories where you go, well, this one time when I, and you're like, oh my gosh, how many times can we sink into a story? And then oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was paced so beautifully, man. And, uh, uh, and I thought that, that, that there is the timing of the the jokes. There's several times where I just laughed out loud and, and, and it, it actually really rem- reminded me of you. I just imagined you sitting there and like your, your words and, and, but the story came to you. So it's you, there's an, there's a story and then you, you put it, can you tell me about that? Like, how did that come to you? Yeah. So this came to me as a rewrite originally. And it was uh, a guy named Greg Magoon who had written the, he'd written a script originally. And then I think it was, there were a lot of elements to the script. It was a completely different story. The concept was the same. Two people pretend to be together for the sake of the family for the holidays. But in his story, it was her family. And the guy comes to town. He's a wrangler for like a, an internet influencer. And this guy is like a 50 year old entitled musician who comes to town and somehow you know, she gets dragged along and then the musician is kind of matchmaker for these two and makes them fall in love. And, and it, the heart of the story just wasn't there. The heart of these two people doing it on their own, finding each other on their own, it wasn't really there. And, um, and then when we were talking in early talks about how to sort of start over with this story, um, one of the things that came up was let's tell this from the male perspective. Let's, we don't really ever do that. Let's have the guy be the reason that the relationship fell apart, have him be the one that's insecure and, and deal with like gender expectations and stuff like that. And, and like, you know, uh, the, and masculinity and what it means to be a man and a provider. And let's, let's actually have somebody really suffer with those issues which is something that's really, really common, but we never, you know, typically at Hallmark, it's like, there's a man's the man and the woman's the woman, but we're like, let's give the guy uh, some of the more traditionally female insecurities. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was so freeing to just go, okay, we started from scratch building the story. And um, a lot of it, like having to justify why they would go to the lengths that they did to conceal their relationship for the family. A lot of that you're working backwards from it. You're going, I have to build a world where we can justify this. We know what the concept is, but if it's not rooted in real pain and real stakes, um, it doesn't work. So the deeper his insecurities, the deeper her need to have this work, And I think that's why you find it really um, poignant at the end. And you go, you really root for these people because you build it so deep to justify why they would do this in the first place. And ultimately when they do come together, it's so much more rewarding. Yeah. And would, would you, would you ever, um, I mean, when he finds the, (laughs) I, it actually made me nervous when he was trying to find the to write the script for the Christmas speech for the governor. I was like, and then he kept ha- never not having anything on the page. It actually made me uncomfortable. I was like, come on, you got to write. Don't go. Come on, man. Text. You got to pick it up here, bud. I, I liked it. And, and now, what, what, do you want to direct, or do you want to just? Is this some? Could you see yourself directing? I think so. I I actually don't know the honest answer to that. I think there are. Uh, I like being creatively in control. 
um, I, it's still, I feel like I'm such a ways off from the technical side of it. And I don't know how quickly I would pick that up. I feel like I'd have to really pour myself into it. I'm also, uh, yeah, I think I would like to, if I'm being honest, it's daunting to me. I I'm really comfortable as a writer. And I think, you know, maybe if I get a couple more scripts under my belt and I'm, I'm getting better with every script, I think I'm working on number Sure. five or six now, you know, like I, I'm, I'm getting better and better at sort of figuring out how to tell these stories in 83 minutes. Um, and so maybe by the time I've written a handful more, I'll feel like I could probably use a lot of that knowledge as a director, but it's daunting. It's definitely yeah. daunting. You should direct, you should, we should throw, we should get a few of us guys like myself, maybe Andrew or Tyler and do a like a men man story and we could do it independent. We could all invest some money and you could direct it. And uh, we'd be great. It. And then we could sell it. Like we'll produce it ourselves and take a big pay cut, but get a chunk of the other side when it's, you know, if it sells or it sells, that's the only way we could do it. Right. Is if we, and there's little companies, there's a company called Mar Vista films that has, you know, they, they somehow talked me into doing this film called uh sweet home Carolina. And it was all, like, we, it was shot in Carolina and it wasn't an A, like, or it wasn't even a B crew. It was like students, but Heather McDonald was my co-lead and she's, she asked me to do it with her. And I was like, well, if you're doing it, I'll do it with you. And it was a really sweet, sweet story. And then they ended up selling it to Hallmark and you know, all that. But it's like, I, I would love to get us guys together just and have it be like, you know, we've talked about this before. We're either we're taking care of a child or trying to raise a teenager or whatever. Um, and we're trying to get the same girl or something like that. And just to let it just be an off the handle fun comedy. With a somebody. comedy. I would love that. I would, I would love that. And you've directed, your film has done really well, like yeah. extraordinarily well. Yeah. I, I you, know. You should be directing. Why are you uh, talking to me about that? You we'll should do, be. You know what we'll do? We can co-direct it where we just make really fun decisions together. It doesn't okay, matter to okay. me. I just want to do a film with you and we pick another dude and our favorite girl lead and we all fight to the death for her. Three guys in a bathtub? <laughs> uh, listen, I, I, I think we've got some, this thing's got legs. I, I, as long as there's a bathtub involved, I don't care how many guys it is. <laughs> And, but I, the tub. you know, we, I, we just, we, I know we've talked about these ideas before, but I really think, you know, maybe we'll get there someday, but I really want to do it. I really want to, I really, I just like spending time with you. And that's part of the reason I want to do this podcast is to actually spend it. Cause how often do you have to get to talk to your friends like for an hour or like this, like just Never. talking and, um, and learning and learning more about there's so much, uh, there's so much that I, that I don't um, want to know about you. Yeah, fair. Yep. Fair. <laughs> Your instincts are spot on, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you have a heart out in what? Um, 10 minutes, right? Yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. So just just so what are you what are you working on next? Are you writing new stuff? Uh uh and you know, I I'm dead serious. I want to see you do some stand up and I also want you to do some do it yourself fix it stuff because every nobody knows how to put their towel rack back in. And what else, what else, other than those two projects I pitched for you to do for yourself, what else are you working on? Uh, I've got a lot of irons in the fire. I've got a lot of things that I'm um, looking to develop there. What's going to happen is they're probably all going to take off at once and I'm going to be in big trouble, but uh, I've got, you know, a half a dozen different ideas that I'm putting together and uh, we'll see. I, I'm happy. I'm happy to take a little break this summer. Uh, I don't know. I'm assuming I will be working on a Christmas movie at some point, but I don't know yet. I'm just, you know, it's it's such a great time, especially as you know, in Vancouver, the sun comes out for three months. So it's nice to just take a little bit of time off and enjoy that weather while it lasts because we we live nine months here for that three months. Last summer, I was inside the entire summer writing Unexpected Christmas, and I didn't get to the beach once. So I'm going to go sun my buns a little bit this mm -hmm. summer, and wow. then uh, we'll see. I think I'm probably going to have a pretty busy fall, but I don't, uh, I don't have anything yet concrete that I can share. That you can share. Well, I'll probably be there in the end of August, so maybe we'll, we'll do a couple, like, we'll do another one of these in person, which is really fun, and then we'll do, like, a, I'll film 
your first like stand up TikTok thing. Um, you like- sh- okay, deal. I'm going to get my, I've got some really ridiculous stand up bits ready. Uh, What's fun about stand up bits too is like you do the stand up thing and then you like, how do we turn this into a narrative? Like, or, or actually into like, so what's what I love, you know, Key and Peel do that so well, right? They'll, they have this bit and then they they actually then give dialogue to different characters to the bit, which is like true. Yeah, um, it's like sketch writing. I, it's true. Like, I think maybe some of my writing would lean more toward sketch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, man, I, I'm a big believer and a big fan of Paul Campbell. Um, and I knew you were like okay but but, la- but last night watching that i was like this guy's like really good and i oh, thank you. i've read i've i've read what 50 of these hallmark things and or more i don't know mm. that have come across and you're just sometimes it's it's like i'd rather peel my toenails backwards or something like sometimes they're they're especially in first or second draft they obviously get better as as they move along and then i don't think that people understand the magic that actors do to some of these scripts because some of them are very like i've there are has been times i've looked at it and be like what are we going to do with this thing i call them undercooked they're a little undercooked that's right and then you get there on screen with a good director and a great act actor and you you, you find it's all between the words anyway and so you bring the magic yeah but yeah but if you start with a good script and then you're tyler and joy and you bring the magic and you can elevate something even further it, it's a uh... It's true. Now, you know, in the wrong hands, humor uh, can be very dangerous. You know, you give it to somebody that doesn't really understand humor or subtlety. And suddenly Mm. that script becomes a disaster. Casting does play such a big part in uh, in that too. And, you know, Tyler and Joy are razor sharp and absolutely prepared the hell out of that movie they knew those characters inside and out had a lot of discussions with them over the course of shooting tweaking things changing things that they found and it was really it was really great to see two people that really understood what we were trying to do but Mm -hmm. it's not always the case you know yeah yeah i mean it was very self-deprecating uh and Mm -hmm. that's the part that right what you know (laughs) right what you know (laughs) right what you know Uh, yeah I, well, I'd love to see you. I know that you'd be a great director, especially actors. It can go either way, but usually director, you know, uh, uh, Harmon's uh, daughter is was also on The 100 and she's an actor and she's now directing Jessica. Yeah. Um, um, I love that. And so so you're you're you don't you can't share. So there's some things that you're you're are you you have a bunch of producing credits on your thing. Well, do we yeah, well, I have a couple, but they're. Um... There, the the network is not willing to do producing credits as anymore. So the 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 credits I've had were as writer producer, and they um, they don't want to do those deals anymore. Wow, that's, yeah, that's not fun. And I know uh, they they think it it hands too much control over to the to any one individual. What's that other movie you wrote and you actually acted in it that I came to your uh that christmas little, by starlight was it no yeah that wasn't called christmas by S- starlight yeah who, who who is the actress kim kim sested yeah 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 that's the name of it yeah it was originally called a starlight christmas okay and then they changed it to christmas by starlight no bathtub uh, no bathtub and the christmas in the bathtub <laughs> uh that was the first that was the first script that we wrote actually that was the first one that was ever fully yeah we wrote it together that was the first one the the previous one sunstand and romance i had produced and then i wrote a bunch of the dialogue but christmas by starlight was uh, from the ground up that was an original Mm. and then we wrote it on spec and sold it just we just sold the script i said together because you had done some other projects together right yeah two others yeah she was great that was a fun uh outing there i think it was like in high covid too and we were all like we were all standing next to each other and be like, are you the one that's going to end my, 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 my career? <laughs> my life. Yes. I my am. Life, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hello. Life. Hello. We're, we're all oh. on. We, right. Right. We were all in bubbles. Like I was on one calls of hearts. She was in something, you were in something. We're like, do we I know. bring our bubbles together and risk? Like, do we merge bubbles here? That was an intense time. Well, if that's someone cool. wants to follow you, Paul, uh, where they can see your stand up um, and your, and your do it yourself, fix it. 
uh, stuff. Where do where where can people? I want to make sure you get out on time here. Um, well, I'm uh, thanks, Paul. I'm um, I'm on Twitter sometimes. I'm the Paul Campbell on Twitter. Uh, on Instagram, I'm official Paul Campbell. Nope, Paul Campbell official. Paul Campbell official on Instagram. And believe it or not, I do have a TikTok account, uh, which I I don't think I've ever posted a single thing. But it's if these walls could talk, T O K. And uh, that's probably where I would start posting my stand-up. If these walls could talk. I love, dude, you have to do it. And it's just, you know, don't, don't be a perfectionist. I, there's a, there's a, and as you're growing, believe it or not, you got to put two or three up a day. And so what, but what, all, what that means is like, you literally put the camera on yourself and you're, and you're like, people have trouble with this. Right. And then you kind of turn it to the the towel rack and you're like, let me show you. And then you set your camera up and you just do it. Like, it, uh, TikTok is under production and over yeah. and over distribution. Right. Uh, Sounds like a big time commitment. I don't uh, know. Less, less of a time commitment because you could shoot that video in 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 a couple minutes if you don't overproduce it. Right. You just just do it in real time. Just be like, or just even share. Like, grab the thing, and he's like, all you gotta do is do this, and then and as you grow, you could you could do a few videos that have more production, but. Uh, it's just about, it's just, a, it's a numbers game on TikTok. content, content. It's just content, content, content. And in something strikes with someone, then they push it out. Um, but it's a much, my, my stuff is growing there way quicker than Instagram. Instagram is like a turtle. I can't even budge Instagram. Well, maybe, maybe I'm going to become a new TikTok sensation. And just bring your dryness and your humor. I would watch it. Cause I, I struggle with my towel rack. It's right. DM me. The, I'll, I'll I'll get you set up with your towel rack. I know exactly the hardware you need to use for that thing. Do you? It's right next to the bathtub, ironically. So no, I know. I know exactly how to fix that for you. It's, it's right next to the bathtub. Send me pictures. <laughs> well, buddy, it's so uh, we didn't get to get into some oh. of the personal stuff, like you know, pain and and emotion and what like what you're the most afraid of. Actually, what are you the most afraid of? Falling down and up escalator indefinitely. Ooh, out! Yeah. Oh, that that you're you. Of course, your answer is that quick. Wow! Just uh, just perpetually falling down an escalator that's going up, and you just yeah. you're in a cycle, and you Ooh. just never leave. That was what a life! What wow. a horrible! How do you even go to the bathroom? You know, that sounds like the worst nightmare ever. Right yeah. now, you're now that's going to be your fear. Good luck sleeping tonight, pal. No, I can sleep. I because I have other fears like that are that are. Like having to go to the bathroom forever and never be able. Yeah, to on an escalator. <laughs> or on the escalator, that's even worse. What do you love? What do you love the most? My son. That's easy. That's too easy. He's yeah. he is a ball of joy. He is he really just is. he's a little clown. He's so funny. He's got a wicked sense of humor. We yeah. laugh and we laugh and we laugh and we yeah. we have joke wars where we make up jokes. We just we just and then we rate them. We give each other points. They range anywhere from zero to ten million, uh, and we just go okay, joke off, and then we just start making up jokes and puns and stuff, and we'll go for an hour just making up jokes trying to make each other laugh it's really just set, just set up a camera and cut that into into every joke is its own little thing that's oh i should that's the account there you go here you go the joke wars joke wars. joking off joking off with paul campbell there you go i like it that's <laughs> you and for tiktok you should just set up your cat and set up a wide and then coverage on you and your son like a bunch of old iphones right and yeah. then just and then just hire an editor in Fiverr to cut it into TikTok one, two, three minute things. And you're and, and Bob's your uncle. Oh, that's so good. Uh -huh. it, it costs nothing. And it, it actually will make people laugh. You'll be doing the world a service. Um, you're hired. Yeah, I'm not the editor. Uh, but so um, what annoys you the most uh, in, in our current kind of world situation right now? Oh, uh... You want to get into this? What annoys me the most is I think honestly, it's like anybody that is unkind, anybody that is unkind for, for no good reason, just people that are not kind to each other. And that's so encompassing of so much of the stuff <clears throat> that we're constantly faced with in the news and, and, and in a, in a, a war in Europe happening and, you know, like 
why, why are we not being nice to each other? Why are we not listening and respecting each other? I, I listening to each other and respecting each other. I just, I, I'm so frustrated with it and it's so counterproductive. It drives me nuts. Yeah, I get that. I get that by some of your tw- Twitter responses when people are being uh, cruel or mean or unusual to others. I got no time. I got no time for that, man. No time for shenanigans. Your responses, though, your responses, like there was there was one there was one you wrote. I, I can't even remember, but it was it was it's what everybody was thinking. You were willing to say what everybody was thinking. And I was like, yes. I think it might have been around the million moms thing with Hallmark. It oh, might yes. have been it might have been somewhere something around that. The homophobes. That 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 it just cracked me up. So it cracks me up so much. I I well, I'll take those, I'll stand and take those people down all day. I got no time for that. I'm a big believer that uh, in love is love is love and love in all forms is beautiful. And if if you have a problem with that, I got a problem with you. And I'm not afraid to say it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even risking your, you know, putting your, and that's what I love about you. You're able to put yourself at risk of being canceled or whatever, because of what you believe you're like, I'm rather going to say what, what I really feel here rather than be play it safe and shut up. So I appreciate that about you, man. Thanks brother. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let you run so people can follow you. uh, And if any, and you know, this world uh, the, the majority I'd say of the people that watch uh, this podcast do would know and love you already from Hallmark. And um, I can have like the biggest celebrity on my podcast. If they're not on Hallmark, it does one quarter as good. Like I've had some folks on my podcast. I was like, Oh, this podcast, this one's really going to get out there. And then compared to like, you know, <laughs> it, it's funny. It's like my audience just loves, uh, loves folks like you. Hallmark fans are the best fans. I think we've proven it time and time and time again, and they tr- truly are the most extraordinary and the most loyal. Um, I think it's why we love doing what we do so much because the fan response and the support is just outstanding. So yeah, exactly. I'm not surprised that when you have Hallmark people on, they eat that up. They do. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a, it's a joy to talk to you, man. And you congr- congrats on all your success. And uh, I, I'm, 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 I want, I will do this again when I come to, to Vancouver and I am going to repurpose our old podcast because I, I really, I just, I enjoy speaking to you, man. I miss you. I miss you too. Let's uh, bring your guitar. We'll do something silly. We'll make some, we'll make something silly and we'll become TikTok famous. How about that? I love it. I love it. Well, you go, you go do your thing and we'll catch you real soon. All right. Thanks buddy. Bye everybody. Thank you for watching. All right. See you pal. Bye. Well, that was Paul Campbell. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed that. And, uh, Thank you for being a part of, of this podcast. And uh, you're probably here watching this on YouTube. You can subscribe if you haven't yet. And also if you're on iTunes, you can hit the rate and subscribe and all that. I have in the background, which you can't see, uh, a part of my Patreon community. They're my live audience and they're invited in. So if you want to know more about that, that's uh, in at paulgreen.com. Uh, There's all that goodies and all that information. But until I see you again, please uh, remember to be kind and gentle and tender and loving toward yourself in your thoughts on purpose. And, you know, make that choice that life is happening for you and you're not a victim. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a little more fun to live that way. Um, But until I see you again, thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing and all that good stuff and um, be catching you real soon. See you.